Our reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to, near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and uh, the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property with dissolute living. When he, spent, when he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to, to his fields uh, to feed the pigs. He gladly would have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer uh, worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and, put it, um, uh, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. Was he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked him what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your, bro and your father has killed the fat calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even as a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured all of your property with prostitutes, you killed the fat calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Thank you, James. <clears throat> and I hope this microphone is close enough that you're able to pick it up all right. Uh, I uh, had my mask down so that I don't have to fumble with it and mess up the microphone. And I hope it's working all right and that you can hear me clearly enough. There are so many ways to be lost, aren't there? And sometimes the consequences are deadly. I wonder if the name Amelia Hart, Urhart means anything to you and whether you remember that name. She was one of the pioneers in the, uh, in the area of flying, of flight. She had many records to her name. She was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic right after Charles Lindbergh, the first to fly from Honolulu to the mainland. Uh, she wanted to be the first woman to set a, so, to set a record for a follow, solo flight around the world. And she set out on July 1937 to fly 11,000 kilometers across the Pacific. 
But she got lost and ran out of fuel and crashed at sea or landed on some lonely atoll and there she died. In the Oscar-nominated movie, The Martian, there is a vicious sandstorm on the planet Mars. The explorers scramble back to the craft, but somehow he's lifted up by the wind and transported to some distant area. The starcraft takes off without uh, the, the, the astronaut, Matt Damon, and he is left behind, presumed dead, lost in space. There are many ways to be lost and to lose things of value. First Nations people lost their traditions, their faith, their culture and language. They lost their children to residential schools and some have been found but in graves, hidden and unmarked. We think of refugees who have lost everything which brought order and value to their lives. And too often there is a moral lostness in the motivation for war and how it is conducted. And there are some who are lost for want of a meaningful relationship and others are lost in spite of a relationship, a relationship in which there is no joy and partners just endure each other. I wonder if you heard about the couple who had been married for over 70 years. The man was 101 years old and his wife was 99. And one hot afternoon they were sitting on the porch on rocking chairs and the old man was nearly deaf. And the wife looked over to him with admiration in her eyes and she said, Zeke, I'm proud of you. He looked around and said, What's that you say, May? <laughs> she raised his, her voice, I'm proud of you. He looked away, I'm tired of you too, May. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus told three parables that are true to life and speak in different ways about how we may be lost. And we didn't hear the earlier two parables, uh, but, but let me summarize. The coin was lost through no fault of its own. The owner should have been more careful. The sheep was lost because it is in its nature to graze and wander away. They're not insightful and make stupid decisions. And the son was lost because of utter self-interest and greed. He wanted his inheritance before his father was dead. We have all kinds of adjectives for him. He was rebellious, restless, discontent, ruthless, arrogant, prideful, immature, selfish, egotistical. What is his problem? Let us dig a little bit deeper. Here is a young man who is a son, but doesn't want to be a son. He is a brother, but doesn't want to be a brother. He's governed primarily by the glitter of gold. <laughs> and there's nothing new uh, about that. There was this young man who was proposing to his girlfriend. He said, I'm not wealthy like Jerome. Uh, no expensive tastes like Jerome. No country estate like Jerome. Not handsome like Jerome, but my darling, I, I love you. To which she said, I love you too, but tell me more about Jerome. <laughs> we go through life saying, what's in it for me? Tell me more about Jerome. And that was the prodigal's problem. It was all about him. The prodigal could just be, the word prodigal could just as easily be used of the father. The, pro, the word prodigal means wasteful or extravagant or perhaps reckless like the first song we sang. 
In his enthusiasm, this father seems to have forgotten all about justice and fair play. The steady and faithful elder brother is all but forgotten. He gives this returning wastrel a new robe and a ring for his finger and sandals on his feet and slaughters a fatted calf to throw a party. The Pharisees would have found this parable frothy and sentimental. And these, and yet these stories reveal to us in a very profound way the depth and true nature of our God. And there is a love there in the heart of God that is deep and extravagant. About 10 years ago, I was in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg in Russia, and I was captivated by Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Return of the Prodigal Son. In the painting, the son has returned home in a wretched state. He has wasted his inheritance and returns in shame and absolute poverty and despair. His clothes are, are a tattered mess. His sandals are worn through. Indeed, uh, probably he is not much more than skin and bones. He has had to eat the corn feed given to the pigs and is utterly destroyed as a human being. He trudges home and kneels before his father in repentance, wishing for forgiveness and a renewed place in the family circle, even to be a servant, knowing that even they live better than he does. And his father receives him with tenderness and mercy. And he noticed something remarkable in the father's, about the father's hands. If you look very closely at the painting. You see, they're not a matching pair. Each hand is different from the other. And we owe this insight to Henry Nouwen, who sat in front of this painting for six hours examining the various details. The father's left hand is strong and muscular, the hand of a man. It would have the power to hold and to grasp. But the right hand is refined and soft and the slender hand of a woman. The fingers are close to each other and they have elegance and beauty. And you can see its gentle stroke to bring consolation and comfort. The father in this masterful painting is not simply patriarch, he is mother and father as well. He touches the son with a masculine hand and a feminine hand. He holds and she caresses. He confirms and she consoles. Both those qualities of father and mother are found in God. Standing at the right is the prodigal son's older brother. Those hands are sort of crossed in judgment. He objects to the father's compassion for the sinful son. He says, look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief. But you, you have, have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then this son of yours, who has thrown away all your money on wars, shows up and you go all out with a feast. And the father said to him, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we have to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and now is found. We know that Rembrandt often painted himself in his wonderful masterpieces. You know, the night watch, there he is in the corner. The crucifixion, there he is, one of the men watching. And Rembrandt makes this observation about this painting. He says, Rembrandt is as much the elder son of the parable as he is the younger. 
When, during the last years of his life, he painted both sons, he had lived a life in which neither the lostness of the younger son nor the lostness of the elder son was alien to him. Both needed healing and forgiveness. Both needed to come home. Both needed the embrace of a loving father. But from the story itself, as well as from Rembrandt's painting, it is clear that the hardest conversion to go through is the conversion of the one who stayed at home. Said Dawan, the more I reflect on the elder son in me, the more I realize how deeply rooted this form of lostness really is and how hard it is to return home from there. Returning home after a lustful escapade seems so much easier than returning home from a cold anger that has rooted itself in the deepest corners of my being. You see, resentment and gratitude cannot coexist since resentment blocks the experience of life as a gift. My resentment tells me that I didn't receive what I deserve and it always manifests itself in envy. Resentment asks, why don't we have this thing? And why do they? Resentment gnaws away at us and can be a springboard to anger, and hatred, and even depression. We long for someone else's wealth or for the influence and esteem they command. Said Bertrand Russell, not really a friend of Christianity, but there were some smart things he had to say. He said, you may envy and respect, you may envy the respect someone receives, <laughs> except for their gray hair. He went on to say, if you desire glory, you may envy Napoleon, but Napoleon envied Caesar, and Caesar envied Alexander, and Alexander, I dare say, envied Hercules, who never existed. How do we deal with feelings of resentment and envy? If there are things we cannot change, we look to Jesus. He deserved to be enthroned in people's hearts. He was good and pure and lovely. And look what we did to him. He did not receive what he deserved. And we can let his bigness of spirit infuse our spirits, sink into who we are. The father wants both of his sons to come to the party, to join the celebration, to feast at his table. The father wants all of his children to come hand in hand to his supper. In the prodigal, in the story of the prodigal son, he is the waiting father. In other parables, he's pictured as a woman or as a shepherd, vigorously seeking after what is lost. And we come to God in so many different ways, don't we? But in all those cases, we realize God is seeking after us because every one of us is worthy, worthy of rejoicing in heaven, worthy of life on a higher plane. Could it be he's waiting for you to come home and enjoy the privileges of home in all its fullness? Long before <laughs> Tony Orlando and Dawn sang the iconic tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, there was a story much like it and uh, uh, preachers have often used it. And maybe David, you have, and maybe Brian, watching from home may have as well. Here is a young man on a train who is deeply troubled 
nervous, anxious, afraid, fighting back the tears. And the older man sitting beside him senses that something is wrong. And he asks the young man if he's all right. And this young man feels free enough to tell his story. And he says, three years earlier, after an argument, a nasty argument with his father one evening, the young man had run away from home. He had chased back and forth across the country, looking for freedom and happiness. And, and with every passing day, had become more miserable. Perhaps he was one of those people who so often is on our streets because they're homeless. And one of the reasons young people leave is because home is so dreadful. Finally, it dawned on him that more than anything else, he wanted to go home. Home was where he wanted to be. But he didn't know how his parents felt about him. After all, he had hurt them very deeply. He had said some cruel and callous things to his father. He had left an arrogant note on the pillow. And he thought he wouldn't blame them if they never wanted to see him again. And he rode ahead and said he would be passing by their backyard one afternoon on a train. And he said if they forgave him, if they wanted to see him, if they wanted him to come home to tie a yellow ribbon on the crab apple tree in the backyard. If the yellow ribbon was there, he would get off the train and come home. If not, he would stay on the train and stay out of their lives and, mother, and never bother them again. Just as the young man finished his story, the train began to slow and pulled into town where his family lived and the tension in him was heavy. So much so that the young man couldn't bear to look. And the old man said to him, I'll watch for you. You put your head down and relax and breathe deeply. Close your eyes. I'll watch for you. As they came to that old homestead, the older man looked and then touched the young man excitedly on the shoulder. Look, son, look. You can go home. You can go home. There's a yellow ribbon on every limb of that tree. There is the waiting father. Perhaps you need to take a giant step of faith. Or perhaps you've strayed just a little bit in your spirit. And the message is the same. There's a waiting father with a tenderness that defies imagination. And that is good news for us, whatever and wherever our lostness and wherever we might be in life's journey. And that is the love that we might receive and we offer to others in God's name whatever the reason for their lostness. Our world is in desperate need of it as we think of the suffering and war and pestilence and different parts of our world. Yes, we need justice, we need peace, we need reconciliation, but right now we need a whole lot of love as well. I wonder if you remember the old song, Jackie DeShannon. I'm dating myself, of course. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Not just for some, but for everyone. Not a love that is merely sweet and sentimental but robust and strong, which can change your life and bring light into our world. Let us pray. Gracious God, how we thank you for your wonderful love. Your wonderful love which is ready to receive us wherever we might be in life's journey. 
And we give thanks for that love that infuses our spirits, that it may overflow in love for others and how much our world needs that love. Be with us this day and walk with us along life's uneven paths. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's sing together in closing. Let's stand. I know these are days when we have freedom from Mass, but we are encouraging you to, asking you to keep your Mass on uh, because we want to protect you and your health and your welfare. And I know we'll want to take some time to greet one another, but 
keep a reasonable distance as well. Those are all things for our protection. For our blessing, I'm going to use, uh, well, being inspired by Psalm 32 and also our reading from Luke 15. Let us pray together. Go forth in renewed strength, knowing who you are, the sons and daughters of God, celebrated, welcomed, dearly loved. Wear your robe and ring with joy. Be glad in God and rejoice, O you righteous. Amen.